Right, I will start because I've got a bit of a preamble anyway. So, um, hi everybody, and thank you for taking the time to join um, join us today. My name's Steve Highwood. I'm one of the directors responsible for our construction consultancy services here at Pure Veritas. So today's webinar is on approved document part B, um, fire safety updates, which is the first of a series of three webinars exploring the latest changes to the building regs, collectively aimed at improving fire safety, thermal performance and efficiency of buildings. With updates to the fire safety guidance set to be included in the building regs approved document part B from December, so next month, those involved in design construction need to be aware of the changes. So just as a quick intro to Bureau Veritas, um, we are a global testing inspection certification organization with 75, over 75,000 um, members of staff operating in 130 countries. So our main services include training, um, statutory mechanical and electrical inspections, certification, engineering, QA, QC audits, um, and a range of services relating into the, in the renewable sector. Um, within the construction consultancy team, which is the bit that I'm involved in, um, core services include building control, the approved inspector bit, fire engineering, CDM, health and safety, so principal designer, etc., acoustics, air quality, um, and asbestos um, on the R&D surveys. Um, in addition to the construction consultancies, we also advise on the ISO certification, um, training, um, and a range of OPEX services, so all your fire risk assessments, et cetera, et cetera. So before we begin today, um, just run through some housekeeping. Andy will present for about 45 minutes, allowing 15 minutes for QA at the end. Um, the session will be recorded and the recording will be shared after the session. Um, if you do have any questions throughout, then drop them in the chat box and we'll try and answer those at the end um, of the webinar. So far, we haven't had any questions that have caught Andy out, so uh, one day we will get there. Um, if you are experiencing any technical issues, then again, let us know. Um, put something in the chat box and we've got a team of people behind the scenes that will hopefully be able to um, assist. So everybody will be on mute throughout the presentation so that we don't disturb Andy. Um, and hopefully we'll find it, you'll find it very um, informative. So today's speaker, Andy Lowe, um, he's our technical di director here at, uh, in the building control business at Bureau Veritas. Um, for me personally, as of yesterday, I've been working with Andy for exactly 21 years. Um, uh, yes, been fun. Um, Andy's also got many years of experience in the building control work, uh, world and has worked on many major projects throughout the UK. Um, he's our technical expert and provides a, a lot of thought leadership and helps train our staff and, you know, definitely the, the projects that I work with him on, you know, he's assisting many, many, many teams. Um, so on that point, I'll hand over to you, Andy, and we'll pick up on the questions at the end. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks, Steve. And uh, I didn't realise it's 21 years. I hope you've learned something in that time. Uh, maybe. <laughs> okay, um, so welcome, everybody. Um, I think this time I'm actually not in the attic. I'm actually in the office, which is amazing. Um, we're going to cover off today the latest um, updates for approved document B, but I'm also going to touch on quite a few other things that are happening in terms of fire safety. It seems to be quite a fluid agenda at the moment um, from the government. People are learning lessons. Uh, we are um, pushing forward into what we call the emerging issues, <laughs> and I'll highlight some of that. Uh, during the, the series, we'll also look at um, the, the other aspect of regulation, such as the thermal performance of buildings and uh, the overheating um, challenges. That'll be on the next one. And then the, the final one will be the Building Safety Act. And again, a whole raft of questions, not just on the process, but how the technical requirements are blending into the, to the uh, 
upgrades to the various regulations and, and guidance documents, which um, which means it's a very challenging time for those who design and those who build. And it's very important to try and keep abreast of what is happening. And I suppose in a way, trying to ensure that we incorporate as much as we possibly can to, to future proof some of the some of the, uh, the developments. Okay, so today we're going to look at um, external walls and what's happening with the combustibility, non-combustibility aspect, which is being up upgraded. Um, we're going to look at the application of those in particular in terms of other um, types of buildings other than just residential. We're going to look at what we mean by an evacuation alert system and the introduction of the uh, premises information boxes and also um, other aspects which are coming into play um, uh, in the new year. So those are the, 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 the formal issues, I suppose. Um, this Part B has been around for since June. Um, it is coming into force as of the 1st of December. So if you've got projects that um, haven't been um, registered, and I'm not going to be registered before the 1st of December, then though this will apply. In theory, I say in theory, but um, uh, the projects which are um, ongoing don't need to comply with this requirement. And those that are registered that um, start before the transitional period of six months, again, don't need to, in theory, comply with this latest requirement. Although I think the general guidance is when this type of change happens that, um, that the industry and the stakeholders um, are pushing towards getting this, these kind of amendments in place. Um, obviously, if you're three quarters through your building, then it's very difficult to change tack. But for buildings that haven't started, then you need to give some due consideration, I think. Although in strict regulation terms, you don't have to adopt them. And which is what the, uh, the requirements are. So effectively, if you start, if you register your building for building regulations, that's not planning, that's building regs before December, and you make a start on site, then before June 23, then you don't have to adopt these. That's the strict interpretation. The government have got to draw a line in the sand. And that's what they do. Now, this follows on for quite a lot of updates that we've seen over the last few years. So we had initial amendments in December 2018. That's when we, we got into the, the debate about um, non-combustible cladding and the government were minded to at that time ban um, use of non-combustible cladding in certain types of buildings, i.e. residential and student accommodation and hospitals when they had a floor over six storeys, i.e. 18 metres. We then moved on to 2020, uh, which we, <coughs> excuse me, had a, an update in terms of the sprinkler requirements, with, you know, making sure we had sprinklers in buildings. And now we've got this, these ADB amendments again. I'm sure we will have further amendments. Um, and I'll come on to that towards the end when we can, I can show you the, the research that the government are undertaking and that that will influence um, where we go in probably the next 12 to 18 months with further amendments. But, so as I said earlier, it's a bit of a, a fluid scenario and it's difficult for everyone to keep hold of this, these requirements, but um, we'll try and um, advise people as best we can um, of when these amendments will be coming forward and what they're likely to be. Um, the definition of work is clearly defined by the government at the moment. Um, I know there's been a bit of um, discussion, certainly with the Building Safety Regulator and the HSE, about they want to try and make this a little bit stricter. But um, the current stance for this and all the latest regulations that have been coming out um, is that a start on site for, for new builds, especially is you can provide a foundation, um, a raft foundation, you can put stone piling in, and you can do a drain run specific to the building itself. 
those are bona fide absolutes that the government released. So it's not made up, it's not conjecture, it's not the whim of the approved inspector, it, this is what the government have said. What it doesn't include though, is demolition and stripping out work, yeah? So that isn't, required, isn't defined as a building work. And if you've got an existing building and you're doing work to the existing building, then putting back a partition or putting something back, which is part of the new works, what would be equally um, applicable as being a commencement of the, the works. Now the commencement of work um, needs to be recorded. So my advice is to ensure that once you've made your application, you get the building control uh, surveyor down onto site, uh, get a site report off them, and then get a letter to say um, that the, the works had actually started. Yes, I, I understand that there's people who perhaps um, might want to try and game the system, i.e. just put a drain run in and then leave it for a couple of months and then come back. Um, but this is the line that the government have raised. They've made this, they have to make a, a stand on this. So this is what they've come up with at the present moment. So that's what the legal requirements are. Anything over and above that um, is not currently a requirement. So let's be absolutely clear. This is from the government. The government have released this guidance. And that goes to all building control um, authorities, both local authority and uh, approved inspectors. So, we are all singing the same hymn sheet. Um, the, the planning ban um, was brought in specifically to, to um, uh, reduce the risk of residential buildings, yeah, being um, subject to the horrific fires that we are unfortunately still seeing around the world. Um, but um, whether it's Turkey or other areas. Um, so this that was brought in um, and it included to make sure that anything over 18 meters or six stories um, applies to student blocks, flats and institutions, yeah, such as prisons and the like and residential buildings. The new requirements drop that down to 11 meters for those type of buildings. So we've gone from the 18 meter now down to 11 meters for flats, student accommodation and prisons and hospitals and the like, it's down at 11. But we've also now introduced another group of, um, of buildings that will be captured by the 18 meter rule. And yes, I agree that the, there are some <laughs> inconsistencies in the, in the, the levels here, but um, it now extended the 18 meter rule at six stories and above to hotels, boarding houses and hostels. Now previously hotels weren't counted because of the, the potential that they had simultaneous evacuation and most of the time they had two staircases so it's up and out um, and they had two staircases. Although there are plenty of hotels with a single staircase scenarios and highly fire engineered but the government have looked at the risks and have said, okay, we had a planning ban at 18 metre plus for residential. We're now going to include hotels in that, but we're also at the same time going to take down the residential part down to 11 metres. Okay, so that's, again, that aligns, I think, with the thinking um, on risk and also aligns with the thinking on sprinkler protection, which is down at that level. So we've got a, quite a major uh, uptake, although I guess that most of the applications that we're seeing from a building regs perspective um, are including these anyway, perhaps by the funders requirements and perhaps by the general consensus that people um, are very clear on what they wanna um, achieve and they want very safe buildings. Um, it also includes the consideration of balconies and solar shading, which um, often gives us some grief in terms of the, um, of the detailing, such as laminated glass and et cetera, et cetera. And you know, 
putting solar shading on buildings, which is um, going to be an issue, more so with the new part um, L and O, which is the overheating issue. You shouldn't be using um, fabrics and you shouldn't be using timber, okay, on, a, on the buildings with over 11 meters. Same definition though, the government stressed um, last time round that we have a clear definition of what is an external war. Bear in mind that previously we never had a very clear definition. Yeah? We do have a definition, it's from the outside face. You can see the screen now, my cursor. You can see it's from the outside face right to, to the inside base of the construction. That is all the external wall. That's the piece that needs to be non-combustible, okay? Or um, limited combustibility if you want to take the A2 route. Whatever happens on the inside face is then subject to further requirements under ADB or indeed the BS guidance, which talks about limiting the surface spread of flame. So you can have a situation where you get all this as A2 non, uh, limited or non-combustible A1, and then you can have timber on the inside base, which is part of the room, okay? That's fine because the part of the room is then limited in terms of its fire spread. So that's how, how that, that aspect pans out. We've again, we've got very clear guidance now on what is being uh, dictated as being what is the height. Although, again, this, we are seeing some, um, some challenges, I think, for this. Um, it now includes, as I see, it says on there in red, including a room in a hostel, hotel, or boarding house. So 18 meter plus measured from the lowest part to the top floor, excluding roof. Um, you would then expect that to be um, uh, non-combustible or limited combustibility in terms of A2 classification. Again, reasonably clear diagrams that, uh, that eke out the, the challenge that we've got. So it now includes hotels. Not sure there's that many hostels being built, but um, certainly um, for, for all the hotel operators, that is a, a distinct difference and they now having to replace their um, their thoughts on providing that type of insulation and the cladding to go along with it. Uh, the government have also updated requirements generally, which I think, um, and I'll be honest with you, I think this is a little over complicated and not wouldn't be my stance on some of this, but um, it does explain in the first paragraph, this is table 10, of ADB, it talks about the relevant buildings. It says, you know, when you are at, at any height, then you are class A2. If you are close to the boundary or if you're more than the boundary, it's still the same. So these are the relevant buildings, okay, with a 18 meter plus floor. Then you go down into more than 11 meters, then you are A2, regardless of where you are in relation to the boundary. However, when you are 18, sorry, 11 meters or less, then obviously the, the, uh, the risks at height are less and the government have um, suggested that we can do class B when you are uh, less than a meter from the boundary. So if you're close to the boundary, you can do a class B. When you're more than a meter away from the boundary, then there are no provisions. So you could have, um, I don't know, a three-story development, less than 11 meters high or two-story development. If it's close to the boundary, you need to put some treatment on, on it. So the cladding, or indeed, if you're using uh, timber, then you can do a class B. Uh, the problem with obviously timber and certain products is that you impregnate it day one, and sometimes the weather leaches it out. So we just need to be a little careful with the maintenance aspects of that. Um, those type of products. But if you're more than a meter away, then there are no provisions. So, you know, two story dwelling houses can be timber um, and there's no provisions for this kind of um, uh, requirements for the, for the non-combustibility aspects. That's what the government think as per the risks. If you look at assembly buildings, say you might be doing a concert hall or a theater or a cinema, then more than 18, 
their suggestion is that you need to be class B. Again, it's whether you want to put different types of cladding on um, and where, whether that cladding can achieve the class B. They must be tested. So we can't be just, um, you know, just putting timber on and thinking that's good enough. It needs to be treated. And then this is where I, I sort of alluded from, where we now got this split, which I think personally was where we ended up originally with this, this 18 meter split and different, different determinations of, of what is required. Um, they're now saying from ground level to 18 meters, it can be a class C. And then from 18 meters up, it needs to be a class B. So there are different levels of treatment. Um, I guess if you've got different distinct cladding products, then you might achieve this. Um, it's based on a risk. So the risk at the lower level means that the fire brigade can actually do something about it with a class C, although there is some degree of um, resistance in terms of uh, fire spread, but not an awful lot. And this only accounts for when you are at least a meter away from the boundary. If you are close to the boundary, you need to do a class B. And similarly, um, when you go to this next piece, which talks about um, up to 10 meters, it's a class C, then it's up to 10 meters above a roof or part of a building to which the public has. So if you've got a, I don't know, a cinema or a complex that you then have a roof terrace, then the walls adjacent to the roof terrace will also need to be class C, 10 meters above that terrace. And then um, there's no minimal performances above that 10 meter height when you are away from the boundary. All sounds to me a little complex. And I think from an assessment point of view, I'm, I'm not sure what the costs are between B and C, but my take would be to try and um, steer people to the class B, I think. Any other buildings, the same sort of requirements, class B. Um, and then you can use class B and can be timber and you can impregnate it, but just be aware of the issues with, um, with the reapplying of the kind of aspects. Uh, there's also a ban now on the composite materials that were um, used or potentially used on, on Grenville. So if we got these um, products with the honeycomb materials in it, then um, we're now saying that they are not uh, allowable and they're banned completely from all types of buildings, which is eminently sensible. And we've got a discussion point on cavity trays. Originally, um, the requirements are very clear that we should have non-combustible uh, cavity trays because the potential for spreading fire around cavities was quite large. The government have listened to the industry um, critique saying that it's very difficult to provide these kind of cavity trays. Although personally, I've seen plenty of solutions. So I'm not sure the government are on the right page there, um, but there we go. The government have now said, okay, we will relax that for 18 months, which I don't, think is a very good idea personally, but if the products are there and are available, then um, you, know, you can use them. Um, the traditional way would have been to do steel or aluminium. And I guess there's not much flexibility with those kind of products, but um, there have been um, some good advances by a lot of uh, manufacturers who are now providing the similar kind of uh, materials with flexibility which will give you the A1 rating. In fact, um, you only need A2, but some have been given A1 rating, which is eminently sensible. So we have a, a, a way forward um, with this relaxation for 18 months only, starting from June um, uh, 22. And also increase for electrical installations, that's for fiber optic cables are now exempt, pretty sensible really. And we have a, a little bit of a, a change in direction in terms of balconies. Uh, they can be A1 um, FL or A2 FL, which allows a degree of combustibility or flammability for the top layer of the balconies. Again, I'm um, amazed that the government went down this road because most people were taking off the timber decking and providing it with other products. 
such as stone or paving. Uh, this now allows for products which do have the, the right fire test classification at A1 FL or A2 FL um, to be applied. Again, what worries me is from a practical aspect is how you maintain those products and how you um, reapply retardants if needed. But this is what the government have come up with um, so far. We still have the requirements to achieve um, class B for the, the membranes that hasn't changed. Um, and that is uh, eminently sensible. Again, we've talked about the A1 classification for balconies. Again, we still see buyers on balconies and the government still um, need to grapple with that aspect. Um, and I'll come on to this a bit later, but um, laminated glazing is still not acceptable. And the government have reiterated that, that it's still not uh, acceptable because it's not A2. So um, to all the architectural friends on the call, um, unfortunately, we still have to wait a while before the government undertake the research to, un to understand whether they will relax that requirement or you're going to have to go and um, buy the very expensive fire rated glazing, which will give you A2 classification. Now, there's only a, a couple of, of, of brands, from my understanding, and it is very, very expensive. So people are tending to opt for the, the panels or the railings, which do give you the A2 classification. So um, something to be aware of. <clears throat> Cavity barriers, um, again, very important aspect. Um, the, the, the requirements are very clear. You have cavity barriers around uh, openings such as windows, doors, and any penetrations. You also have them at the same time um, where the, the compartments, especially for flats, intersect with walls and floors of fire rated construction, and it close the cavities at the top of, of, the, of the heads of the overall cavity. So at that point, you just need to be careful about what type of cavity barriers you are proposing. A lot of debate, especially with London Fire Brigade at the moment, and especially on the explicitly on the higher rise developments, where we're seeing the questioning of open state cavity barriers. Um, especially around windows, and this pertains really to rain screen type cladding. Um, our recommendation is that you avoid open state barriers um, around the windows. Um, maybe it's more acceptable at the compartment level when you're talking about rain screen, because the rain screen has to, to breathe, but we must ensure that we don't allow smoke to get into that cavity in the first place. And there are various issues with a the testing and how the 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 intermessent operates in practice and whether there's um, enough guidance around to to really review that um, and indeed i think uh, we've had you know, half a dozen or so more lately concerns being raised by by various people and including the fire brigade about what happens if smoke does get into the cavity how do they fight the fire what are the reaction when the fire department turn up to see you know, potentially a fire on the you know, lower levels um, with smoke billowing out the top of the building? So <clears throat> we need to think about that a bit more carefully and maybe that will be the next iteration. So our suggestion is that the, that absolutely needs to be reviewed, uh, not just for residential buildings, but maybe for other types of buildings in terms of insurance risk. But for certainly from, from our viewpoint, um, the residential aspect is very key. Uh, government have also um, upped the access requirements in terms of fire service and made us absolutely aware that the, the uh, fire inlet connections should be visible from appliances. So we can't actually have um, hiding of dry riser outlets. They should be absolutely visible and it's very clear um, in the latest guidance that that's what's expected. So again, something for us as designers to think about. Um, yes, you can deviate from the red box on the wall um, and provide a more in-keeping box, maybe brass, steel, whatever, but as long as it's clear 
and it's labeled correctly as per the BS 999 and the associated BSs, then that should be acceptable. Okay, so we need to ensure the fire brigade can see where their dry riser is, or indeed wet riser if it's an infill. Uh, they've also now included the evacuation alert systems for blocks of flats um, with, um, with a floor over 18 meters. Now, the evacuation alert system is a separate system um, run by the landlord. This is where um, you have a separate sounder in individual apartments. So this allows the uh, management under direction from the fire brigade to evacuate levels of buildings um, without actually going to individual flats themselves. So this is to um, assist the fire brigade in getting everybody out of the building. Um, some people call it the big red button where you can press the button and all the, the, the flats would get an alert, a different sound, different sounder that's in your flat. Um, nine times out of 10, it's in the, in the hallway of your flat. And then people would understand that and then um, evacuate the flat. This allows the, the, uh, the fire service to completely evacuate the whole building. Yeah? Most of the time, it's more sophisticated than that and it allows a, a level by level um, evacuation. And it is a separate BS, but it is not just the linking of fire alarms back to the concierge. So it is a completely separate system. Um, it's been uh, in Scotland for some time, and now the, the uh, English requirements are um, including this, this, uh, this provision, which is there to assist the fire brigade in uh, evacuating, especially tall blocks. Uh, also, a good idea is to include the secure information boxes for, for purpose group for flats. Um, it should have all the necessary information in this box. Um, it should be readily secured and identified. Ideally, it should be on the outside of the building so that people can then, um, when they enter, they'll have all the information from the outside. Um, and this is information that would help the firefighter, such as what the materials might be for the walls, um, the layouts of the flats and, the, and the, the floor plates and various other aspects of where the stop valves are for the sprinklers, um, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so, um, and it's also recommended that it applies to large complexes, um, not just uh, just for flats, but that's what the, the requirements are for this particular uh, inclusion in part B. Uh, the requirements also, for the, um, the overall uh, non-combustibility of cladding also uh, needs to reflect on what happens when we do change of use. So when we change an office block, perhaps to a block of flats, then previously you only needed to consider the external part of the building where, when it was over 15 meters. Now it drops down to 11 meters. So you can see they're trying to make sure that whatever you do, that you take account of the risks um, of the, of the ex, from the external walls. So you take the walls um, and you need to make sure that it now anything over 11 meters, which is probably four story most of the time, um, you need to be including for non-combustible cladding. Uh, assessments in lieu of tests. We had this some time back, back in, 2018, where we need to make sure that the testing of products is appropriate and should be based on UCAS accredited tests. No longer are we accepting um, aspects which are um, assessments, although it doesn't pre uh, preclude assessments for everything. You can, if you um, deem it necessary, undertake the, the assessments, but the assessments must be based on reviews by accredited personnel and indeed um, people who are um, versed in reviewing uh, the testing that's available from UCAS accrediting and including detailing their competence, et cetera. The general issue though is to try and avoid any assessments and to ensure that we get tested um, aspects and it needs an upgrade in terms of the testing facilities in the UK. 
those who are involved in cladding. Um, there's only uh, uh, two or three testing facilities and they're always fully booked. So it does put a strain on the tests and the testing um, facilities. Uh, we know that we now have got to have 11 meters, which is the criteria for, for sprinklers in flats. Um, just need to make sure that we, everyone is aware that when we say sprinklers in blocks of flats, and it says all the building, it means all the building. So if you are building a block of flats and you've got retail below and you've got a car park beneath that, then the expectation is that the whole building is sprinkler protected. I know there's been um, some conjecture about whether that um, is, is the right guidance. And I suppose you could engineer that out, but I think um, most fire services would frown on that and our expect, their expectation is for fully compliant buildings with, with the, when it says all, it means all of the building, not just part of the building. And I mentioned a little bit on the wayfinding signage, which again is eminently uh, required to ensure that the fire brigade know what level they're on. And this was a direct uh, reflection on what happened at Grenville. So the fire officers need to know what level they're in, in the staircase, but not only in the staircase, they also need to know um, what level they're in, in the lobby when they come out of the lifts. Um, and again, general wayfinding signage should, uh, should identify that in any event, but it's just, there's some guidance in the proof document B that covers that. Uh, alongside those main requirements, there is also um, the uh, provision now of what's called the Fire Safety England Regulations 2022. This is um, an upgrade to the, to the RRO re requirements, and this comes into force um, from January 23, uh, where the, the Fire Brigade now are, would expect the building plans to be provided in a secure information box. Again, this applies to all high-rise residential buildings. It requires you to, um, to ensure that the local fire brigade have enough information on the materials used for the external parts of buildings and to make checks on lifts, firefighting equipment, such as dry risers, wet risers, um, smoke ventilation, and evacuation lifts in the building to make sure they're all in working operation. Again, there were issues with some of this aspect from Grenville. So this is why the government have pushed forward these safety regulations. And if you don't um, have this equipment checked, then um, obviously the, the fire brigade turn up and review, then they're liable to, to take necessary action. Yeah? Um, the requirement is that if you have a, def a fault on it, you're supposed to let the fire service know that your um, that your lift is uh, not working function properly, and that you've got a plan in place to ensure that you will um, you will amend and um, repair as necessary, along with then giving the fire brigade some comfort, so they are aware of any issues. We know that buildings do have these repair issues. It's just making sure that everyone is upfront about this so the fire brigade can take appropriate action um, should a fire occur. Uh, information boxes, again, is now a requirement to provide this box and um, alongside all the relevant information. So um, <clears throat> that's a, a, a positive point, as is the wayfinding signage, yeah? So to make sure that people can understand. Now this applies, um, to all those high-rise residential buildings. Um, <clears throat> and alongside that, anything which has a 11 meter plus story height, so four stories or more, they'll have to undertake fire door checks. And these flat entrance doors in particular will need to be assessed. Um, and indeed all the common parts will also need to be assessed on, on an annual basis um, and to make sure that, that the fire doors fit properly and uh, are maintained. So just need to be very careful with this. This puts a lot of onus on the landlords to understand um, their, their requirements and to make sure that we don't, um, don't change things without necessary um, approvals. This uh, is being driven very much
by the uh, by the Grenville recommend phase one recommendations, which talked about the fire doors in particular, making sure the fire brigade have got inf information and good signage, and indeed that all their equipment is maintained properly. Um, so that's a, a good step forward, I think, in terms of that aspect. But we need to make sure that all the existing buildings adhere to this. Um, and there are, as I say, it comes into force on 25th of Jan, and there are lots of good fact sheets on the Home Office. Uh, essential that you have a very good fire risk assessment to ensure that it captures all that. And of course, the fire risk assessments do have now the, the responsibility of reviewing what is in the external wall and the, and the, the BS, sorry, the PASS 9980 is the, is the best starting place for that kind of assessment process. I'll just rattle on through now the last five or 10 minutes about what actually has changed other than fire safety. Um, we do have the updated part um, F and L. Um, those will be upgraded yet again um, in 2025 or in 2024 stroke 25. We will see sometime next year an upgrade again in the part L, obviously very topical at the moment with the climate change and et cetera, et cetera. So we pushed now into the first piece, which was about encouraging more electric usage um, and away from gas. And now we'll see it ramp up even um, stricter in terms of those kind of requirements again. So we're likely to see um, uh, some quite stringent issues with looking at renewables and um, whatever to count for that. Um, part M, Again, we're expecting to see accessibility be uh, raised and the bar for compliance being raised to the current uh, BS8300 because the existing part M for, um, for commercial type buildings is based on a 1999 version. Uh, we're also gonna see an update in uh, the dwelling scenarios where it will be very limited on the use of category one which is the, what we call the visitable, which is just basically a WC at the ground floor and very few um, requirements. That will be phased out into limited only. And most people then will be looking at CAT2 and CAT3, which is the wheelchair units, which is already happening in London. And that will become part of the, of the mainstream guidance. Um, we've always seen the part S the provision of charging points for electrical cars um, and all the issues about that. But just note that the government guidance is very clear that you shouldn't be putting that inside uh, covered car parks, including basements. You put the cable routes in until the government have undertaken the research and gone through that and made sure that what you are putting in is gonna be safe. So the government are on with that. So that's the current issue. I know a lot of planners ask for that in any event and don't potentially understand the risks of putting charging points into these uh, into basements and the like. Um, part O is a separate discussion all about overheating and how we get around that and of course we've got the London plan which again reviews the lift provision in the evacuation scenarios. So those are ongoing issues. Um, we've also got the, the requirement for the uh, protection of corridors in terms of wiring. This is where um, the associated IE regs, not 18th edition, requires um, in flat complexes that the wiring is, in, is protected where it goes down corridors. Um, so you need to think about how you protect that, potentially in using things such as Durasteel or equivalents down corridors, yeah? So that means you you, ensure that there's a less risk in those protected corridors in flat complexes. Um, <clears throat> I've also got the update for um, part J, which included the, the carbon monoxide alarms. Um, to be perfectly fair, most of this will fall onto the gas boiler uh, installers. Um, it, it is already in force um, from October 22, um, and the transition rooms are very short um, up until January 22, January 23, but um, most gas uh, installers are already undertaking this in any event. So there's a bit of 
advice there, but as I say, most of it's specialist um, for those installers. Uh, we do have a, a tall buildings circular letter, which is interesting because um, it's really almost like a rebuke, I think, from the BRAC and government to say, you shouldn't be using approved document B for tall residential buildings, especially single staircases. So that's the, the that's their, their stance. In other words, you should be using a fire engineered approach. And certainly for the projects that we're working on, um, we would always encourage that, um, that, that QDR, quality design review, reflection on what type of code should be applied um, is the best way forward. But that's, uh, the government have, have made a very clear statement on that. So we just need to be very careful. Um, the debate about single staircases is ongoing. We know that um, London Fire Brigade are going to issue a position pa uh, paper. And I would expect that there'll be some caveat around about the 50 metre mark. Um, but it doesn't mean that you preclude you from, from doing taller buildings with single staircase. It just means you need to um, look at the fire engineering in more critical detail and potentially add more aspects in to make it even more safer. Um, so that's probably where we end up. And I know that the building safety regulator raises concerns uh, for buildings um, over these, these heights of 50, 30, 50 meters um, and raising the same kind of general comments. And I suspect when we get the new guidance in BS double line, uh, double line one, um, sorry, treble line one, and indeed BS double line double nine, which is for non-residential buildings, um, we'll get some better guidance and updated guidance in that respect. Uh, the government, as I said earlier, are doing um, some research and it's, it's useful to, to, for, for the industry to understand what they're doing and what this might lead to. So the government have published this list. They've also said that they have actually let all these contracts out. So um, when Rishi decides to squeeze everyone's uh, uh, budgets, then this is already out there. So they are reviewing guidance for specialist housing. They're looking at disabled escape and the research for that. They are will obviously include the evacuation lifts, the lobby approach, which was in the draft, travel line one. So there's gonna be a whole uh, review of, of how we deal with disabled people. There is a discussion on the use of laminated glass. That research is out there. There's a consideration of SFS. There's looking at construction products and the toxicity of certain products and whether that's a serious issue. There's a review of the modern methods of construction and whether that needs special consideration. Um, a review on the testing of uh, external walls and we've got property protection at the end there, which talks about um, a review of what other countries do, which I think is um, probably a, a relatively uh, non-event. So the government are on with this discussion points uh, and I've let the research, so there are people are out there doing that kind of research. So um, it will come forward in the next 12 to 18 months, I'm sure, and will influence the next versions of ADB and the BSs, which I, I'm hoping will be relatively straightforwardly drafted and will, will coincide with each other, which would be really helpful. Um, what else is planned? Well, um, we potentially get an update of Trevor Line 1 in March, although we're hearing it might now be the autumn next year. Um, we've got the issue about BB100 for schools, which then looks at the provision of evacuation lifts and indeed um, the provision of sprinklers in certain types of schools. Obviously, we talked about the number of staircases in buildings. Um, we've got uh, the Building Safety Act, which is a, uh, a very process-driven uh, issue, but also the Building Safety Act is much wider than just high-rise residential. It is a cultural change to ensure that everybody considers, considers fire safety in the right frame of mind and in cover, in, it does incorporate every type of building and indeed at all levels. It's just that it seems to be focused on the higher rise at the moment. 
Okay, so generally speaking, we've got lots of technical upgrades, lots of detail, and again, the detail must be considered because it can drive some of the um, some of the, the early thoughts. We are seeing further enhancements based on the Grenville re inquiry report, such as the, the uh, evacuation alert system and the introduction of the Fire Safety England regulations, and I'm sure Wales will follow suit. And we've seen, um, or we are seeing the introduction of the Building Safety Act and other regulation issues which will come about. So there's a lot of things happening over quite a short space of time. And I understand the issues about the, the application and the date you serve the notices and the date you start work on site. Um, it's all good to, to, to understand that, but it's also good to understand what the end game is. The end game really is to have safer buildings. Okay, Steve, sorry, I'm a little bit late than I thought, but um, over to you. Yeah. Cheers, Andy. That was uh, really good. I like your new tactic of uh, keep talking to reduce the number of questions, but we'll we'll address that later. <laughs> um, so we've got lot, loads of questions in. Um, clearly, I know the answers to these, but I will ask you. Um, evacuation alert systems. Um, can you just talk about a little bit more detail on that? So I'm assuming that they're this is the you know kind of phased evacuation system and is it separate to the fire alarm system yeah now um it's not phased evacuation as such it is a um it's a, uh, a system that allows the fire brigade or the management under control of the fire brigade to alert everybody in the building or floors on the building whichever the, the fire brigade um, choose to do to alert people to then evacuate themselves yeah so it's a separate system it's run from the landlord system rather than the individual um, the individual alarm fire alarm system within a flat it's normally provided only in the hallway although bigger flats might need more than just a sounder in the hallway it's a different sound so that the tenants will be, need to be aware of that it's a different sound and it, it, it instigates people to get up and out, um, potentially when there's no fire in their particular floor or in, in their flats. So it allows the, the brigade to evacuate everybody um, should they feel the need. Remember I talked a little bit about whether the building is, you know, the, the use of barriers and open state barriers. If the building is that far advanced and the smoke is pouring out the, uh, the facade, then I would think from a dynamic assessment perspective, the most fire brigades would be using that day from the start saying, get everybody out of the building. So it is a mechanism that isn't currently in the regs, but is now, um, and it, it's a it's a, a review from, from the Grenville, which talked about providing that kind of separate system. So separate sounder, separate wiring, all wired down to the landlord's control point, which is next to the fire alarm panel um, for the, for the uh, for the common parts. Okay, great. Just to let everybody know that there's loads and loads of questions coming in, so we will answer them all, and then we'll we'll send out a document with responses. So if I don't ask it, it will be answered. So don't worry. Um, restrictions on green roofs over eighteen meters. Any thoughts? Yeah, um, this is an interesting one. Um, my take on it is that the the roofs in general so if it's a roof or a maintenance roof or just a plain roof then there's less risk um bear in mind roofs could be at different levels in the building don't have to be on the very top um so there's less risk for that there's more control because you've got maintenance personnel maintenance personnel can be trained blah blah have proper plans in place so there's less risk so they normally um, uh, can be accommodated. However, lower down the buildings and indeed on areas which are um, subject to uh, use by, by the residents um, present more of a risk. And we need to be very careful about those risks. Um, my, my counsel to, to most developers is you should try and stick to A2 uh, classification. Um, but I get the issue that green roofs um, do present that problem, but they can be managed. Smaller islands of it 
rather than across the whole terrace. Terraces are particularly an issue, especially with barbecues and et cetera, et cetera. So you need to be very careful with that approach. Okay. Um, number one, BS double nine, nine one. Uh, residential buildings and the use of or designing in single stairs, single staircases. Okay, yeah. I mean, at the moment, there is no restriction on that. You just have what the government have said, don't be using approved document B because approved document B is for simple buildings. Um, when you go into the single staircase at height, then you need to be looking at other codes and the use of travel line one, which explicitly says when you go over 50 meters, you need to have a qualitative design review and you need to look at what you're providing, what if scenarios, what if the sprinklers fail, what if the smoke ventilation failed, um, et cetera, et cetera. So that gives us a much better analysis, fire engineering analysis to be able to do that. Um, the new guidance, as I alluded to, may include some limits on height, um, it may not, but I think we, we will be driven um, by the fire engineering fraternity on that. And also London Fire Brigade, as I expressed earlier, um, are going to provide a position statement on what they think is a, is a, is a, um, a reasonable um, height from their perspective as firefighters. Um, and we need to respect that, but of course, um, there's not one caveat for all. Everything will be, um, can be, and you know, we are expecting lots of engineering aspects to, to be put forward. So it isn't, you can't build single staircase buildings, but you just need to be careful um, and you need to put a lot of effort into building that kind of construction. So you're saying that, you know, kind of like part B up to 18 metres post above 18 metres, then you're looking at the BS standards and fire engineered solutions. Yeah, on, on a rough basis, yeah, that's that's some, the sort of thing we would expect. And if you're going above 50, then you are taking it up another notch. Um, I guess for, for developers, um, they'll obviously have to think about what their funders will require, and it may steer us down the above 50 plus metres, you need two staircases, which a lot of developers in London are already doing. Um, but just because you've got two staircases doesn't make it safer. Um, we just need to think about how you, you know, put two staircases back to back with the two doors next to each other. How is that safer? You still got to get to the staircase. So there's lots of things to think about and lots of engineering to be to be um, to review. I mean, simply if you put two staircases down either end of the building, then that that would be better, but not not doesn't necessarily suit all developments. Yeah? So we have to be careful with um, overall caveats. Yeah? So one that's just come in, which relates all to this. Um, so again, the, the draft 9991, in terms of, are you taking that into account when reviewing applications today? Or are you saying, right, well, it's still only in draft, push it to one side. Yeah, the, the principles in the, the draft Trevor Line 1 are being reviewed um, for some schemes, but it's very dangerous to use draft guidance, which will be subject to an awful lot of up, upgrade. Yeah. Uh, we know that the Fire Brigade um, provided a lot of commentary, and there's been a lot of commentary on the use of pressurisation, for instance, for these single staircase buildings at height. Um, so I don't. I think it's very uncertain, and I think the principles of providing disabled evacuation and how you achieve it is certainly one to think about, and to um, ensure that we get lots of. Sing if we're going to do down go down the single staircase, then we need to make sure we are, we are very robust. But apart from that, I wouldn't entertain reviewing the draft guidance in any detail because it's likely to change. Okay. Right, I think we, we are, we're on 12.30, so I think we've run out of time. Um, as I said, we, we will answer all the questions and circulate the, the responses. Um, so thanks again, Andy. Um, as mentioned, well, as everybody's aware, the, the session was recorded, so we'll share a copy of the recording, um, a summary of all the questions, CPD certificates, um, and a copy of the slides. Um, hopefully everybody's found it um, of interest. 
Um, if you've got any other questions, then again, either drop myself or Andy an email and we'll build that in. Um, on a slightly separate note, um, some of you may be aware that it was the Fire Door Safety Week this week, um, which is a, a national thing. Um, Bureau of Veritas has launched a new guide on fire door safety and compliance. So I'll follow up um, with the attendees, um, post this by email, and I'll, I'll add a copy of that um, document also, or give you the link to be able to download it. Um, and then finally, we've got two further webinars um, in the series coming up. So we've got approved document L and O. Um, so that's on the thermal performance and overheating. Um, that's on the 16th of November. Um, and then we've got the last one on Wednesday, the 7th of December, which is about the Building Safety Act. So if you haven't registered, then register soon. Um, and then, well, thanks very much for joining. Um, thanks, Andy. Um, and thank you very much. Have a good day. Speak to you soon. Thank you.